Time for the second half of the quantum mechanical time-dependent perturbation theory story, where we actually get to the perturbative expansion, which is known as the Dyson series. In my last video, link in the description, we arrived at two important pieces of information. The first of these pieces of information is exactly what physical quantity we actually seek to calculate in quantum mechanical time-dependent perturbation theory, because it differs from time-independent perturbation theory, namely we seek the answer to this question, what probability does a particle have of being knocked from a given initial energy state to a given final energy state by some particular localized in time, time-dependent potential perturbation, where these probabilities are called transition probabilities. The second key piece of information we gained from the first video was the interaction picture equations of motion, which will make a doable task of the job of perturbatively calculating the transition amplitudes from a time-dependent potential. Before we actually get to the task of developing a perturbative expansion, we need to write down a more mathematical definition of what we mean by a transition amplitude. This is a nice start, but we need something a bit more specific than those boxed words. Recall from the last video how we have chosen to split up the Hamiltonian. Namely, we have an exactly solvable part and a time-dependent potential perturbation, where I define these unperturbed energy eigenstates. With this in mind, we can consider expanding an arbitrary state at time t equals zero in terms of the unperturbed eigenstates. Now let's consider the time evolution of this state, first in the Schrodinger picture. In the Schrodinger picture, we must account for both the direct time evolution of these unperturbed eigenstates and that caused by the potential perturbation. The unperturbed equation can't cause time dependence in the coefficients, naturally, and the potential perturbation obviously can't affect the unperturbed states because they're specifically defined as that potential perturbation not being there. All that gets us to this, where of course the time dependence of the coefficients exclusively comes from and represents the time evolving effect of the potential perturbation. Now if we take the inner product with another unperturbed energy eigenstate, we arrive at this conclusion. We find that the CN of T coefficients are phase equivalent to the probability amplitude for the time evolved state being some particular unperturbed energy energy eigenstate, i.e. their phase equivalent to transition amplitudes. In the interaction picture, we have this change to the state, and the expansion therefore reduces to this. We see that in the interaction picture, the exact correspondence holds even at the amplitude level. You may have noticed that embedded in this treatment, especially the original goal statement, is an adiabatic assumption. We assume that the time-dependent potential perturbation is zero at t equals negative infinity and t equals positive infinity, and that it is of some particular form that either is very localized in intermediate times, or at least comes into and out of effect adiabatically. Starting with an expansion at t equals zero, as we did, this is what I'm referring to, if that's not clear is convenient because, given that vi of zero isn't zero by assumption, the cn coefficients don't select out a single peer state by assumption, namely the initial state. However, we can still account for our adiabatic assumption because we can assume that a peer state has been evolved from t equals negative infinity to t equals zero to yield that psi state that we started with, including times when the potential perturbation may have been in effect, of course far away from negative infinity, and that it is therefore no longer a pure unperturbed energy eigenstate, as is apparent from the fact that we're bothering to do this expansion. In many texts, one will take t to be a very distant but finite time, as will the final time, actually, and call this idea the adiabatic approximation. Some will even take t0 equals 0 to be the early time, not done here, and some large positive time to be the time of perturbation, or the time of interaction, depending on what they're doing. It is under this condition, the adiabatic assumption, that our conception of a trend transition amplitude as stated makes the most sense, namely a transition between two unperturbed energy eigenstates induced by a time-dependent potential perturbation. This idea is an important one to remember because it is, among other things, the underpinning of transition amplitudes in the standard perturbative quantum field theory. Now that we know exactly what we mean by a transition amplitude, we can commence the development of a perturbative expansion for it, that is, finding a perturbative expansion for CN. 
n of t. The approach we're going to take here is the following. We will use the interaction picture equation of states to develop a perturbative expansion for the interaction picture time evolution operator for the states, namely this, and then we will relate matrix elements of this time evolution operator between unperturbed energy eigenstates to the transition amplitudes we're interested in, the CN of Ts, so that we then have a perturbative expansion for them. Given this definition of the interaction picture time evolution operator, it must clearly also satisfy the interaction picture Schrodinger equation, which gives us an equation to start our expansion with. We'll also impose this ordinary initial condition if we're I'm evolving from one time to the same time, it should just leave it unchanged, it should just be equivalent to the identity operator. We can then use this differential equation and this initial condition to write an integral equation for the time evolution operator that's easy to iterate, simply this, nothing unusual. If we then insert this expression into itself repeatedly and ignore the one remaining term on the right that still contains ui, we have a perturbative expression for ui of t comma t zero to any order in perturbation theory vi that we wish. It's pretty straightforward to just write out the general case. This is called the Dyson series, and it's used in many different areas, and was actually originally invented by Freeman Dyson for use in QED. Keep in mind that there is no guarantee that VI of T commutes with itself at different times, so we must not change the order of the VI factors in any of these integral terms, and for the same reason we must also maintain strict time ordering as we do the integrals. This is usually just called time-ordered integration, and it turns out that we can actually rearrange this such that it ends up being uh, a sort of exponential looking thing except with time-ordered integration and that's often called a time-ordered exponential. I didn't go through the process here because I didn't really see a lot of value in it. But note that that exists. We now have only one step left, and that is relating the transition amplitudes that we want, the CN of Ts, to the unperturbed energy eigenstate matrix elements of the time evolution operator whose expansion we have. To do this, remember the definition of the time evolution operator. We can then apply a complete set of states to this expression to get the transition amplitude. We remember this quantity from above, and we definitely remember expanding it in terms of unperturbed states, but of course there's a unique way of doing that for any distinct state, so we can just equate these matrix elements with the CNs. We can then bring in another time evolution operator factor to get it in terms of the unperturbed initial state, and then transition to the Schrodinger picture to make sure yet again that it's valid to call CNs transition amplitudes. This of course is what we're used to calling transition amplitudes, and these phase factors will just go away when we square. Now you may wonder if this phase factor here would cause problems when we take t0 equal to negative infinity because this phase factor is oscillatory, it's not going to converge nicely, and of course we can take that limit after squaring and just ignore it, or we can take this t0, as I was saying above, to just be some very distant, finite time so that then there's no ill-defined anything. Now this point about the validity of calling CNs transition amplitudes as we usually understand them is essentially the same as the point that I made above, but I figured why not be as clear as possible? And with this relation we are ready to write out the lowest order perturbative contributions to these CNs here. Note that writing them in terms of the familiar Schrodinger picture quantities that we'll end up actually working with in practice introduces all these phases here. Now I hope it was clear, but I suppose I may as well note it. We of course have to sum the perturbative corrections term by term before we take the square to get the probability amplitude. From time to time I have seen students square before they sum. Standard time-dependent quantum mechanical perturbation theory, as you'll find it in all the quantum textbooks, basically consists of calculating these C quantities and then squaring them to get the probabilities, all for various different cases of V of T that either come to you in homework problems or out of a research context. And with that, we're done. I hope this video was interesting. Thanks for watching.